So I, uh, I hear you guys want to learn about unfiltered tanks, huh? Smaller than tanks? You talking jars? Vases? Fish bowls? Containers like mayonnaise jars that aren't even designed for fish? Well, you've come to the right place. Let's talk about it. Let's get nano with our filterless. All right, everybody, welcome to the secret history living in your aquarium. So just to show you that I have no bias against high-tech tanks, hugely planted tanks, big fish, medium fish, whatever you want to call it. I, I love all, all ways of keeping fish. And there's not a right way or a wrong way as long as the fish are healthy, the plants are healthy, and you're happy with the way you keep your fish. But today we're going to talk about getting rid of the filter, no filter, getting rid of the heater possibly, no heater, no CO2, nothing fancy, maybe even getting rid of your light depending on the setup you want. So let's talk about the fundamentals of how this works and the key bits of information that you really need to know in order to pull this off well and long term. All right, when you guys are thinking of nano tanks or wabikuzas or little uh, presentation jars or containers, you may be thinking of something like this. However, today we're not going to be strictly talking about this because oftentimes these tanks are temporary homes. You can keep a betta in it, you can keep fry in it, you can do whatever you want with fish that fit, but if you have it set up like this, without much surface area, without enough plants, and without the right substrate and being cycled, it's just not going to support life long term. And because of that, I don't recommend this style of tank for any fish, really. There are a few exceptions. We'll get to that in a future video. But really, this is more of a few shrimps, a few snails, and some plants. What we're going to talk about is having a fully functional ecosystem within a small container. So let's talk about that. All right, so here we have another jar or container that's holding about three gallons of water. A whole bunch of it has been displaced because of what we did with the substrate here. And what's going on here is a deep substrate bed that is designed to be a filter. And I'll have to hop back to a real filtered tank with a hang off the back or canister filter to show you how this mechanism actually works and how it works in nature. So just remember though, check out my videos on substrate and layering and how to create an anoxic or anaerobic tank to learn more about how this works. What we're talking about is downsizing this all into a small container. Now this is on the bigger end of small containers and you can see that there are plenty of plants in here that are stem plants and they have the potential to tap the energy of this aqua soil down here. Now this is ADA Amazonas soil and uh, it is a great uh, Amazonia soil is great by ADA but it has ammonia nitrates and nitrites now plants love to eat from ammonia itself but fish and shrimp and creatures in your tank will die if they have ammonia any higher than 0.5 or so becomes very very dangerous for them so we want to avoid that the way we can do this is by creating a cap layer or an inch to two inches of sand. The finer the sand, the less depth it needs to be. You could create a cap layer with inert stuff like I have up here, but this is more aesthetic. This is fluval stratum that doesn't give off any organic material. So it's not as good for the plants long term, but it does kind of look like soil and it lets you uh, plant the plants nonetheless if you fertilize the water column. But if you want your plants to grow long-term, you're going to either need to populate these lower layers with fish poop, basically, fish waste and plant waste that breaks down, and 
or water column fertilizer. Now, as I said, with the little container, you could just never have a cycle established where you're turning your ammonia into nitrites, into nitrates, and being processed by each step of that. You should familiarize yourself with the process of uh, the ammonia or the nitrogen cycle uh, if you don't already know it. But basically, we are trying to get this to work without that. So we're not going to do the filtration in a filter. We're going to do it in the actual container, right? So where is it going to go? What I need you to do is remember what this stick looks like. This stick has algae all over it, which looks like moss, and some of it is moss. <laughs> it's a uh, stick that's been in another tank, and so it's also loaded with good bacteria, and that's why the tank is foggy right now, because I just built it for this uh, contest I'm doing and for uh, the, the heck of it. But we've also got plenty of plants with fine leaves, if you notice that, and they all have roots and they're stem plants. None of them are rhizome plants other than this decorative one that's running up and around which when it gets out of the water if you have something like pothos or any sort of decorative plant where the roots are in your container and the rest of it is outside of it that will suck up more ammonia and nitrates and nitrites than anything in the tank because it has basically life on steroids by not having to be underwater the light isn't as filtered, the CO2 in our atmosphere goes directly into the plant and the oxygen exchange is directly in the plant. However, you, you may need to spend some time actually transitioning it. So, I want you guys to remember all the different surface area in this tank and even these stones have a little slime coat on it that's full of life and nutrition for our fish that will be in here soon uh, or especially for shrimp and snails if that layer gets too big and there's too much dead plant material or fish waste however it will cause an algae bloom and likely the nitrates nitrites will go up to the point where we'll have to do water changes because either your plants eating it and then you trimming your plants is the one way to get rid of nitrites and nitrates that are in the water or doing water changes is the other and a filtered tank the only difference is you're putting things in different places so I want you to remember this rock layer and all this space we have here too because I'm going to show you an older tank that was filterless in a short moment but before we do that I want to show you some more plants that are growing above water so you can get an idea for how well they thrive and how they need less light than the plants underwater. So again, we've got floating plants and they're all flowering under this light. These are red root floaters and in this tank, they are extremely healthy. I don't use much fertilizer other than a little bit of potassium a little bit of manganese and a little bit of magnesium zinc and a little trace amount of iron I don't add any carbon or nitrates or nitrites that's all supplied by the fish and their food fish food can also build up in a tank and so it's far better to create surface areas and little micro feeding grounds for algae eating fish than it is to have to have to feed them in a small container but soon you can actually start growing plants up and out of your aquarium if you want and they'll actually start to flower now there is a transitional phase where the material will die away if that's going on you need to make sure to remove things like this from your tank uh, so that it can transition but the same will happen if you take a plant that's been living above water and put it underwater it's called immersed versus submerged here is a fern this is a African uh, fern that's growing underwater and has now come up it will soon start looking like that and within a few months or a year this will be a big bushy fern hanging out of the tank 
sucking all the bad things and waste products out of this tank, which is great. Now, briefly as a cautionary tale, I wanna show you this, which was another container that actually filled up with moss. Now, this was an experiment and it's three years old, but you can actually see the gas, whether it's oxygen or CO2 or sulfur uh, gas of some sort, and you can see the other stem plants that were in there, but the moss outcompeted everything being in ambient light and not having a spotlight over it. Again, this is Ludwigia growing outside of the tank. That's a sundew growing up on top of the moss, more uh, Ludwigia and a hydrocotyl. But this is just Java moss growing very densely with low nutrients. And again, half of this little container was substrate. What did I keep in here fish-wise before it was grown over in moss? I just had a few shrimp and a few baby Madaka rice fish when they were less than a quarter inch or so. They would eat all the little algae and little microbes and little tiny, tiny critters like these white dots on the outside and little jumping water fleas and things that live in every aquarium of a certain age. So you actually want all those things. You want to add things like this and things like these little scuds, which in here we've got some baby fish, but we're also growing out little uh, isopods or amphipods of different types. And you can see their exoskeletons as well as some of them swimming around doing their thing. Well, these are adults. They also produce dozens of babies every week, and the babies are great food for your fish. Now, these are called scuds, and uh, this is one way uh, you can oftentimes have live food in your container. You can even seal it off if you have small enough fish that eat slow enough, and they can sustain themselves just on that. But if you watch my episodes under the microscope, you'll learn that all these bacterial and fungal and uh, archaea layers that are on our surfaces as foods break down and as substrate break down become covered in tiny little creatures, little worms and little single cell organisms that nanofish absolutely love to eat. All right, so I told you guys to remember uh, what we had in the other tank as far as uh, surface area and substrate. The first thing I want to address is what that tank will look like in a number of years. It will look like this substrate and if we look at it, and pardon the glare in here, but the iron loving bacteria that is oxygenated has oxidized and stored itself in this orange band. Whereas sulfur loving bacteria is in the aerobic or the anaerobic or very very low oxygen to no oxygen range and you can see where the ranges meet and then there's a cyanobacteria that's green in here some people don't like that and they try to get rid of all this and it's an uphill battle in your small container that's not worth fighting so when you look at it this tank has sand and even though it's full of fish that do their business and create waste. I have enough shrimp in here, and I love these ones. These are Malawa shrimp. They're a Caridina species that's very, very hardy. They break it down and eat it, and then when they go to the bathroom, they leave those tiny little pellets on top, which then slowly settle, and either algae grows on them like it is here, or the microbes and little teeny tiny life forms break it down until it works its way down as a finer sediment and goes down, 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 and it will store in the spaces between those rocks you had, which are serving as another place for water to also seep in and out of. And as temperature changes and as gas pockets form and bubbles go up, water is a polar molecule and it will slowly churn and move around just like in a lake bed. There goes a pregnant little shrimp and the shrimp in this tank provide all the food for these guys and other than an air stone I put in here last week for a video this is a filterless tank that has been going for quite some time and uh, you can see that it has both rhizome plants and plants that are not, that are 
planted into the soil. So it's tapping into that nutrient rich layer where all this waste eventually settles down into. That stays separate and your cap of sand or silt is gonna save your fish. So one more emphasis of this was, do you remember what that stick looked like? Well, it looks a lot like a lot of people's fish tanks sponge filters look. And it's important to also have snails in your tank to help break down waste. But the other great thing snails do is they churn the substrate. So here we can see Malaysian trumpet snails, which are the best at churning substrate. And you can see the tank still is stratified, but even in two inches or so of, of substrate here, because we've got a filter to do more filtration work, it's still sequestering all those nutrients down there. And if we have stem plants, they grow very, very healthily as long as they have light. They just need bright light and they'll produce great colors and very dense growth with good light. If you have ambient light, then you need to rely more on slow growing plants like sword plants or sawasertang or moss. But the great thing about those plants is they actually provide surface area for algae and for which also processes nitrates, nitrites, ammonia, and also creates oxygen. Anything that creates photosynthesis uh, usually has the byproduct of oxygen and in the nighttime, carbon dioxide as waste. But you can see here that this coconut the surface area is actually covered in biofilm and we've got snails eating that and growing and in this tank there are too many snails i must definitely say there are too many snails but even using porous rock or rock with a texture on it you get all sorts of biofilm layers and i have a video called aufuchs and it's a german word a u f w u c h s i believe and it it will go into depth about what these little layers are what the little uh, tiny dots and the stuff that looks like water stains but it's on the inside of your tank what all that is and this is where we can then start deciding what kind of fish we want now if it's heated we can put whatever fish you want in there if it's not heated i would direct you at looking at a lot of the native fish uh, up here we have a least killifish uh, hanging out up in the top water and uh, they're pretty shy but they're a great little live bear they're the smallest live bear in the world and then over here we've got guppies none of these tanks have filters and they are just relying on all this low light growth of hornwort and uh, we've also got kabamba we've got uh, anacris and uh, parrot feather and moss and then as a substrate instead to show you guys another option this is used for spawning a lot of egg uh, a lot of egg scattering fish and you can actually see the babies down there but it also using marbles it, it's the same as rocks would be and you can see that the silt and poop and waste actually filters down to the bottom where all your little microorganisms are going to be working on it and your fish then will not get to it and stir it up. And eventually, even without thick layers, it will stratify. But the problem with that is then you need to treat the, the tank like a filterless tank that is high in nitrates and nitrites and ammonia and you need to do water changes or remove plant material which is storing the nitrogen cycle essentially for you. So other options that I would recommend, I have whole videos on great nano fish, but a few other that work out great are the native rainbow shiner, if you have a little room for them to move. Uh, any of the lake inlay species uh, are great, like the uh, celestial pearl danio or the uh, emerald dwarf rasbora. In here we've got some CPDs living and uh, they're hanging out back there with their beautiful sparkles, but they live in actually a subtropical climate. Again, the baddis, uh, the scarlet baddis, the blue baddis, the chameleon baddis, they're all great fish that live in subtropical waters, so I highly recommend them as well. So, now that you have some ideas for fish, rice fish are another great one, 
And here's another bowl where we don't have anything. We're just relying on water changes and never worrying about the tank filtering. But they produce such a small bio load, these baby fish, that I don't have to worry about anything but changing the water, say, once a week. So that's another way to go, but it's not the way I recommend. I think that having it all self-contained is by far a better way to do it. And even in tanks with filters, it's great to have that algae and uh, all the different layers where your microbiome and all your plants and algae can live, even in low light or ambient light, where you can get a very cheap shop light or clip-on light like this one here, or even like this one from uh, Lowe's that's, that was about $12 and it's doing all four tanks. Now you're gonna be a little more prone to algae if it's not tuned to the, the plant growth wavelengths, but still, it's a great option and I highly recommend it. Lastly, I wanna show you guys a tank that has a filter and I wanna show you how the filter is actually just like the substrate in those other tanks. It's just building up that debris and then we clean it out. Instead of cleaning it out, we're storing it at the bottom of our container, and that's why a third of our container needs to be substrate. And then over millions of years, all sorts of bacteria and microbes have evolved to feed off of it. And what's really interesting, this tank is set up the same exact way as that jar out there, is that this isn't very old, it's only four or five months old, but the grass and things that are growing in here, the roots start growing right at the nutrient rich layer that has uh, all the organic waste in it. And it started to break down and fill in in between those loose rocks. And the, the roots are feeding there. But if you notice, they're not feeding in the sand too much. They'll spread out and then go down right where they meet that organic matter. So even if you use a neutral substrate because you're worried about your water getting too much ammonia or nitrites or nitrates and not having a filter, your sand cap for one is protecting you, but two, your plants are immediately going to put down roots and start feeding exactly at that level, however deep it ends up being, all the way down to three or four inches if you need it. So. I just wanted to show you this biotope tank and show you how similar it's still functioning. And again, above the water plants, they do all sorts of fun things like flowering, and it can be really fun to play with in those small containers, especially if they're getting natural light. So, I have for you guys today, and I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it was a bit long, but if you have more questions, search this channel and I've probably covered the topic. And uh, I gotta get out of here. My wife and I are gonna go see the new Top Gun, I guess, tonight. So if you enjoyed it, hit that like button. If you really enjoyed it, you could become a member or subscribe. But more than anything, if you just come back and watch more videos, it'd mean the world to me. Thanks, guys. It's been Alex Williamson with The Secret History, living in your aquarium. Talk to you guys later. Bye.